Would you open your Bibles to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 19, Acts chapter 19. Find the book of 1 Corinthians, if you're using a, a leather bound or a paper Bible, find 1 Corinthians 14, put a marker there, and then go to Acts chapter 19. As I shared with you, I want to share with you on a topic as we continue the series Pursue Power. Last week I talked to you about the Holy Spirit and having the Holy Spirit working in you and with you and through you so that you can overcome life situations and find the greatest fights and win the greatest fights and battles that you've ever had. It's the power in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Today I want to continue to talk about the Holy Spirit, but I want to talk to you about uh, a personal experience that I had, a personal experience that you could have, but I want to prep it with this. As I said, I've talked about this topic maybe three times in the last five years, all three times a person got up and left. So if you have to get up and go to work early, you know, let's declare that now so we don't think you're walking out on me. <laughs> but they got up and, got, and walked out in a huff, um, never to be seen again. And, and I would ask if you could just listen to the end and hear it all. And when I get to the end where we have questions and answers, Ask any question that you want. And what I want to talk to you today about is a personal experience that I had that I find in the Bible and that many people have had, but I want to help people who have had this experience to know why you should have it and what it's for and to answer any questions. I want to talk to you today about the gift of speaking in tongues. And I'm going to share with you why it is extremely important that we have this gift and what it will do in your life. If you've been, what's happened is a lot of people have had some misunderstanding or misinformation about the supernatural. And I would like to share it with you in a way that the Bible says and answer your questions of the why and the when and the how and all of that, whatever it might be. Have you ever eaten at a restaurant and you had a really good experience? Have you ever eaten at a restaurant and had a really bad experience? Okay, that's been that way in church. Some people have had really good experiences in churches and some people have had very bad experiences in churches. And, but just because you've had a bad experience in church doesn't mean that God wants you to stay away from church. Church is where God creates everything and everything is happening through the church. And it's extremely important that we see God move and that we stay connected. When you have a really bad experience at a restaurant, do you tell somebody? You know that the average uh, survey says that when you have a bad experience, you will tell 10 people. When you have a really good experience, you'll tell one. That's scary to pastors. No pressure there. <clears throat> but here's, here's what I'd like you to, to understand. When it had comes to, to the gift of speaking in tongues or having your heavenly prayer language, there's been a lot of misunderstanding because it's been mixed up with emotions. It's been mixed up with a lot of stuff, a lot of hype. I, I am not um, a hype preacher. I am not one that is uh, going to look for pushing the emotion button kind of thing. What I am is just realistic, trying to tell you what the Bible says that will change your life. At the age of 21, I had some people start talking to me about the infilling of the Holy Spirit. They started telling me about the gift of praying in tongues. They started telling me all about this stuff. And I, my statement to them and my question was, why? What good is it? What, what do I care? And, I, and I, I, I had no desire at all to seek the spiritual side of God or the spiritual side of speaking in tongues because I thought it was crazy. I, thought, I was raised Lutheran <laughs> and a good Lutheran boy, catechism, altar boy, all the stuff, you know, and then I found myself when I was in the military, I found myself in um, a Baptist church and I found myself giving my heart to Jesus and committing my life to Jesus just as a, as a, person that is wanting to say, yes, Jesus, have me. In my last part of being in the army, I lived in South Korea for over a year. 
And in South Korea, I was a chaplain assistant. And that's what started the journey to, the Lord put me on a journey to get me into ministry, was while I was a chaplain assistant in South Korea, uh, working that, working with the chaplain and being in church all the time and being in church work and church administration, and church business, I, I got connected in that way. And I, I met a chaplain assistant who was on the DMZ and he was under my command. He was under my authority. And I had about six chaplain assistants who worked for me. And we reported to seven different chaplains. And one of them was on the DMZ. So I actually visited Panmunjom several times. And I actually did step into North Korea and step right back out. You know, um, but I, I remember talking to him and he told me about this church. He goes, yeah, when chapel is over and we've done our duties, he goes, I get on a bus and I go to Seoul because we're north of Seoul. And he goes, and I, I visit this church and this church I visit, he goes, we put headphones on and we hear it in English. And it was Dr. Cho's church. And I said, hey, can I go with you sometime? And he said, Sure. Sure, because I was intrigued by what he was telling me. It was, it was this big, gigantic church. It turned out to be the largest church in the whole world. <laughs> and and um, there was a death in his family, and the army sent him back, and I never got to visit Dr. Cho's church after being in South Korea for a, over a year. So I get back to California. I get out of the army. I meet some people. We're going to church. I'm going to an Assembly of God church at the time. And... Um, they're telling me about the Holy Spirit. And again, I'm resistant. I'm, it, to me, I, ha, I, I'm, I, I have to think everything through. Everything has to make sense. have to have a lot of reason behind it. And it didn't, make, it didn't compute. And so I just kind of pushed it off. And one day I was sitting, I was in my bedroom, and in the living room was, the TV was on. And you have to remember, this was a few years ago. I was 21. And there was this television station and they, they didn't have cable. There was no such thing of cable. There was UHF and VHF. And the UHF, you had these antennas and you had to dial stuff. And there was this thing called Channel 40. And that's what they called it. They called it Channel 40. It's officially TBN. And they were hosting an event uh, at the Anaheim Convention Center. And a man was on the stage, and they called him Pastor Ed. He was an African-American pastor, and he later became the pastor of the studio, basically. And what happened is, I was in the other room, and I heard on the TV this sound that intrigued me and pulled me. Literally, I just walked in to the where the TV was. Now you have to remember, these were TVs, not flat screens. They're in a box and they're on the floor and they're, they're gigantic. They're a piece of furniture. Okay. So, and you, you look down, not up at them. So, I mean, some of you have never seen, go to a museum. They, you know, <laughs> go to Disneyland in that carousel thing, you know, over by Utopia and you'll see one in there. You'll think, what is that? And it kind of looks like a washing machine. <laughs> and what happened is, is I came, I came to the front, and this man was standing on the stage in the Anaheim Convention Center, holding a microphone, and he was giving a public utterance in tongues. And I did this. I just stared, and I listened to every single syllable that came out of his mouth. And then he gave the interpretation, which is saying in English what was being said in this unknown heavenly language. And I'm still like this. When it's all done, I mean, this is my um, type A personality. I get up, I look at it, I walk away and, and say out loud, that was God. That, that was my emotional experience. I said, that was God. I just knew I knew, I had never ever seen it, I'd never heard, I'd never heard anybody speak in tongues, I'd never heard anybody give a public utterance in tongues. I just knew inside that was God. And I went to bed. 
And that was it kind of thing. And then I started to think about it and think about it. And that put me on a journey to, to find out more. And then what I did is I got a hold of this tiny little book. It was a little pamphlet by a ministry called Women's Aglow. And it was kind of like the um, Christian businessmen thing at the time. And Women's Aglow, and they put out this little pamphlet and it had grapes on the front. And it was about the Holy Spirit. And you read it and explained a little bit about the Holy Spirit. It didn't, it didn't explain enough for me. I have all kinds of questions and I want all kinds of answers. It explained a tiny bit. And at the end, there was a prayer for you to get filled with the Holy Spirit. So here I am in my house. Everybody's in bed. It's 11 o'clock at night. And I read this prayer and I literally do this. I'm sitting on the couch and I... I read the prayer, closed the book, and then I opened my mouth. <laughs> Nothing happened. Nothing at all happened. I did that three nights in a row. Nothing happened. I assume that I would be wrestled to the ground by the Holy Spirit and that I would convulse and shake and something would come out and all of a sudden I would have this experience. Was I so wrong? So I just started to talk some more, ask some people some more. And then this kid, I call him kid. He was, uh, he was older than me, he was 23. I was 21, so he's an old guy. Really experienced in the Lord. So he's telling me about the Holy Spirit and that he prays in tongues and I'm asking questions. Well, some of the questions I'm asking, he's not answering. He's not giving me very good answers and stuff, but I, I didn't care. So I wanted, I wanted to get prayed for. So I made everybody leave the house except him and I. I didn't want anybody around. I was extremely introvert, very, very private, and I didn't want to experience this with anybody watching because that would be weird for me. So I had everybody, n n nobody's now. So again, we're at 11 o'clock at night for whatever reason, and I don't know why, because I'm a morning person, not a night person. I'm in this little tiny house in Buena Park. It's a house that I bought when I came out of the army. I bought it for $42,000, 750 square feet. In Anaheim Hills, that would go for like 1.5 million. <laughs> <laughs> and is a, a, just this tiny little house and this friend of mine and we were literally sitting on the, on the carpet like this and I said, okay, I want you to pray for me. I'm sitting like this and I don't know why I'm sitting like that. There's no special spiritual reason for it. And he gets on his knees like this, no special spiritual reason at all. I, th there's no method to it. And then he puts his hands on my head and he begins to pray. And he starts to pray for me and and. All of a sudden, this is the experience I had. Everyone's had a different experience. I don't know why I've had this experience. It felt to me like somebody grabbed my shirt collar, opened it up, and dumped in the back, in between my shirt and my skin, a bucket of ice. That's what it felt like. And I started to shake. And the next thing I know, I was speaking in tongues. I was told by so many people, it's easy the first time, it's the second time you speak in tongues. See how bad I've been informed. That's really hard. And so they said the second time is harder than the first. And people are like, you know, when I tell you the truth, you're going to laugh like crazy. But I, nobody was telling me anything. And, and I, so after I, I, I spoke in tongues for a few moments at the time, and I was shivering to this day when I preach, to this day, when I preach and I pray for people, my hands get ice cold. Why? I don't know. I shake hands before people, in, before church. People go, your hands are cold. I say, ooh, that's good. <laughs> because normally my hands are very warm, aren't they, honey? <clears throat> so what happened is, um, th this, what, what, what happened <clears throat> is I excused myself. I said to him, excuse me? And I went into, you know, I went like 10 feet into the bathroom. This is a very small house. You know, closed the door. And I said this out loud. God, they say that the second time's harder than the first time. I'm doing the second time right now. And I spoke in tongues in the bathroom. 
And then they came out and said, okay, I'm filled. <laughs> that was very ignorant, but that was my experience. Now, here, let me tell you this. Because of that event, I knew that I knew I was different. I was different on the inside. When I read the Bible, I read it with different eyes. I knew something happened that I was changed and I was touched by God. I knew that, that at that moment I had a very, very personal experience with God. I knew that at that very moment something would be different forever and it has been. So in that tiny little house, I ate at a great restaurant that I would like you to visit. And I'd like to share with you. Because what I did is I went on the quest of what is, what good is it? And I found the Bible is full of why a person should be filled with the Holy Spirit and why it's good for you. So I'm asking you just to listen until we get to the end, and we'll also do questions and answers to make sure that you can have anything that you are concerned about or thought about, get your questions answered. So I'm going to talk to you today about the infilling of the Holy Spirit with the evidences of praying in the Spirit and you having a prayer language. I pray in the Spirit every day. I pray every single day in the Spirit. I pray, my, my routine is I get up very early in the morning, anywhere I'm up anywhere from uh, 4.15 to, if I sleep in, it's 6 o'clock. You know, sometimes I sleep in at 6, you know, yesterday I slept into 6.15. I was like, whoa, wow, the day's half gone. What am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I, I make myself a pot of tea, and I sit down and I pray in the Spirit for 30 minutes. And I do it every day. I pray for you, I pray for the church, I pray for your family. I pray for your healing. I pray for your business. I pray for your job every single day. And it's not out of legalism. It's out of joy. It's out of an intimate moment with God. And I know, listen to this, that praying in the spirit is a miraculous event every single time you do it. It's miraculous. The God of heaven, the God who created everything, in his sovereignty and his great wisdom, decided that the church needed to be infused with power, with the Holy Spirit, and have a language that they would be able to communicate spiritual truths beyond their own abilities. And the spiritual ability to comprehend and know things that you would not know any other way. So I want to share with you, it's not as an emotional thing, not as a wacky thing, not as some crazy thing, but as some supernatural event of God that you can actually have the wisdom of God and the will of God in your life more often when you are connected in that heavenly language and have that prayer time with you and the Holy Spirit. And let's go into this right now. Um, I, I'm going to skip a couple of, of screens because I want to get right to the main point that we're talking about, as I've been sharing with you. you are, I ask you to open to Acts chapter 19. <clears throat> Look at Acts chapter 19. Here is the story that we're going to read. Verse 1. And it happened when Apollos was at Corinth. Pa Apollos was another contemporary preacher of Paul's day. Apollos was a pretty powerful guy. He did a lot of things for God. He's not as recorded. It's not as recorded as often as Paul. Very, he, he appears a few times in scripture, but Apollos was one that was a contemporary. Like if you look at Paul as being an apostle and he's in this area, Apollos is usually on the other side of the Mediterranean, the other side of the community, and he's doing just as many powerful things for Jesus. He says, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper region, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, Paul is on a road trip. Boom, 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 boom. He's on Route 66 and he comes to Ephesus. And when he comes to Ephesus, he finds some disciples, which means they're believers. He finds disciples and he says to them, 
Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And obviously, when Paul is hanging around these disciples, he's sensing something is different. He's sensing there's something different with these disciples and other disciples that he's been around in many different cities. And Paul asks an unusual question that's not recorded in any other city that Paul visited. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? So Paul must have felt that they were missing something. Something wasn't quite right. Something wasn't connecting. And here's what they said. We have not so much a heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him that is on Christ Jesus. So John's baptism pointed to Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about 12 in all. Obviously there probably were some women there because it says that the men were about 12. So there were probably some women. So we have a small group of people. We have a home Bible study. And in this home Bible study, Paul's hanging out with them and he's de he discerns something's missing. And he asks, he goes, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said, no, nope. And so he prays for them, lays hands on them. And right away, these disciples start to speak in tongues and they prophesied. There are five different accounts in the Bible, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, where people are filled with the Holy Spirit. Five different accounts. And a couple of them, there is also the gift of prophecy operating at the same time that they get filled with the Holy Spirit. But in all of them, they speak in tongues. Every single one of them. And so I, as a young man, um, seeking all that, that God had for me, I, asked, I started asking questions about speaking in tongues, about praying in the Spirit. And it took me years to get answers that I'm going to give you today. And so here's one of the things I'd like you to know right away is that, that the power of praying in the spirit, that there are two types of spiritual tongues. There's a public tongue and a private tongue. And according to the Bible, in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 12, 13, and 14, Paul lays out a lot of instructions about the public use of speaking in tongues. He talks quite a bit about these things. In fact, go to Acts, or 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And what I mean by there's a public gift and a private gift, it is proven throughout the Bible that every individual can receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit, have their heavenly language, have their prayer, their prayer language, and pray at home, pray privately, or pray in prayer groups um, with the Holy Spirit leading you and guiding you and, the whole, and speaking in this heavenly language. But not everybody will have the gift of publicly speaking in tongues. The Bible clarifies that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Shall all speak in tongues? The answer is no. Shall all do miracles? The answer is no. Shall all um, perform or do healings? The answer is no. The gifts or the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, which are listed nine of them, are for public or ministry um, purposes. And not everybody's going to have those. Not everyone is going to stand up in a public setting and speak in tongues and have someone else give an interpretation. But everyone can have their private prayer life. And that's what I want to talk to you about today is your prior, private prayer life. Acts chapter 14, verse 14. Before we read it, I need some consensus here. Do you believe Paul was a pretty good guy? Yeah. Yeah. I'm talking about Paul the apostle, the one chosen by Jesus. Do you think, and the guy that wrote two thirds of the New Testament, do you think he's important? Yes. Would we agree? Yes. Okay. This is from him. So Paul the Apostle is writing about this spiritual gift of speaking in tongues. And he's writing it to all the church in the entire world. I personally believe the reason this one gift, speaking in tongues, is such a controversy throughout the United States. It's not outside the United States. Inside the United States, it's a controversy. is because the devil is trying to shut you down and not walk in the power of the Spirit. And here's what Paul the Apostle says. For 
If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. So Paul says, if I pray in the spirit or in tongues, there are synonyms in this purpose of teaching. If I pray in the spirit or pray in tongues, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. So right away, Paul communicates to us. And nobody told me this as a, as a kid of 21 years old, seeking God and being more hungry for the things of God and not knowing that I was being pulled by the Holy Spirit into a life of ministry. I didn't know that at the time, but I just knew I wanted more of God. That was my attitude. That's what, what I was kept saying and kept communicating. And I, and I, no one explained this to me, that when a person speaks in tongues, the origin the language originates inside your spirit, not inside your mind. It originates inside your spirit in the place that God is resident, where your spirit becomes a new creation in Christ Jesus, where old things have passed away and all things have become new and you become alive in him. And you are, you are living in a supernatural, miraculous realm inside your spirit. And then when you pray in the spirit, this miraculous event comes through your voice box, your vocal cords, and comes out of your mouth. And your mind hears it for the first time through your own ears. It doesn't filter through your mind through your mouth. It filters through your mouth into your mind which is a supernatural act of God. And God says, you know what? There's just going to be some times you need to get out of the way and let the Holy Spirit pray so that we can get some things done in your life. God believed we would mess it up if he didn't fill us with his presence. I kind of think it's cool though. I, I, I like being filled with the presence of God. And so here's what he says in verse 15. What is the conclusion then? Here's what Paul, the apostle says. I will Pray with the Spirit. And I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit. And I will also sing with the understanding. So the understanding is your, your language that you speak. Some of you speak four or five languages. Some of you speak, you know, three. Some of you are most, you know, most of us are Americans. We speak one. And, but you're, it's your understanding. Whether you speak Spanish, English, French, it doesn't matter. If you know that language, that's your understanding. And Paul says, you should sing with your understanding. But you should also sing with your spirit. There are times where we should be lifting our voices up in that supernatural heavenly language in song. First time it, I'd ever heard it. Again, I was 21, newly filled with the Holy Spirit, and I visited Melody Land on a Sunday night or Thursday night service. It was like it was a miracle healing service. And all of a sudden, so this kind of dates me, if any of you know anybody, you know, um, Rich Cook, was playing piano. And we had the worship song and stuff like that. And then Ralph Wilkerson preached. Then at the end, people were standing and all of a sudden, people just broke out in praise. People's hands were raised. We're just praising God. And then all of a sudden, I heard this sound. To me, was this beautiful, beautiful music being played. I opened my eyes and nobody was at the piano. Nobody was at any instrument. Nobody was in the orchestra section, wherever the band was. And I looked around, and it was just the audience singing in their heavenly language. And it was the first time I'd ever heard that. And I was overwhelmed with how wonderful and beautiful it was. People say that if... if a non-believer finds out about speaking in tongues that it will scare them away. It didn't to me. I was a non-believer about tongues. It didn't scare me. It made it real. It realized I found out that God is true and that he is supernaturally changing people's lives. And so I continue to say here that we're supposed to sing in the spirit, sing in the understanding. Continue, verse 16. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the, the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? 
For you indeed give thanks, for you indeed give thanks well. And Paul says that even when you are, when you sing in the spirit, you give thanks well. That's what he said. I don't know about you, I kind of like giving thanks well. I like giving thanks well. And then he says here, uh, verse 19, yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others than 10,000 words in a tongue. So he says, for the preacher, it would be useless if I stood up here and I spoke in tongues. Even if I gave you 10,000 words in an unknown language, I may be having a spiritual experience on my own, but it does you no good. And Paul says, I would rather give five words in the understanding that I teach you something than speak in tongues publicly. So he understands that he's got some boundaries here, that it's not intended for the Sunday morning church service in this massive form of communication. It's intended for a private form of communication between you and the Lord. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, same chapter. Look at verse 2. Here's what it says. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to man, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. I have it on the screen and I highlight the word mysteries. The word mystery is an interesting word in the Greek. It literally is a fraternity word. And it has to do with mysterious things that are unknown to you and you get to know them in eventually. In fact, as a fraternity word, it would be like if you were going to a fraternity in the fraternity and you joined one and it had different levels. And it had the entry level and at the entry level you knew nothing. You were just, you, you know, <laughs> you're just going to clean toilets. And then as you move up in the fraternity, you get to know other things. And then as you move up higher, you get to know other things. That's this word, mysteries. Now, I have to ask you a question that's extremely important. Now, you need to answer it. If you are speaking in tongues, and the Bible says you speak mysteries, things that are not known, who are they not known to? God or you? The Bible says that a one that speaks in tongues speaks to God. Look at verse um, 3. But he who prophesies speaks um, edification and exhortation and comfort to man. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. He who speaks to, in tongues edifies himself. The, I have the word edify up. Now I'm going to talk to you about the word mysteries and the word edify. And the word mysteries means that there is stuff you don't know about your life. And the only way you are going to get to know them is if you speak the mysteries. As I said before, that when you speak in, in tongues, a non loan language, that heavenly language, it comes from your spirit and it comes through your voice box, your vocal cords, out your mouth and your ears hear them and your m brain or mind collects the information and for the first time your brain heard that. And God says, I've got mysteries to show you that you need to pray into your life. There's mysteries about your future, mysteries about your family, mysteries about your finances, mysteries about your relationships. And the only way you're going to know these mysteries is if you pray in the spirit. God has designed for you to know what's coming in the future by praying in the spirit. And if you pray in the spirit for your life, for your family, for your business, for, your, for whatever it is you are doing in life, if you will pray in the spirit, God will allow you to speak mysterious mysteries, spiritual truths over those situations, and you are going to perceive them inside your heart. Now we get to the word edify. This word edify is where we get our English word edifice. An edifice is a large structure, a great big building, something that is e enormous, enormous. And it says that if you speak in tongues, you build yourself up. You edify yourself. You actually get stronger. You become a structure that is strong and tall. Imagine... When I lived in Buena Park, it was a small 750 square foot house. The garage was so small, and I'm not kidding. I had a Toyota Corolla stick shift, and it was my very first car I ever bought. Bought it brand new, $2,300. I lived in a different world. I would drive that car into the garage 
and could not open the doors because the garage was so small. I could get partway open, but I usually had to go out the window. And the one reason I couldn't open it is because that was the only place to put the washer and dryer was in the garage. Or else if the washer and dryer wasn't there, I could have scooted over and, and got out, you know, because then it was a lot skinnier too. But imagine that house, 750 square feet. Now imagine a massive skyscraper downtown LA that you can see for miles away. When you get born again, you start as this little tiny home in Boyne Park. And as you pray in the spirit, you edify yourself. The Bible says you build yourself up and you can turn into a spiritual, spiritual tower. You become stronger and stronger and stronger. You become a skyscraper. It says in the book of Jude, verse 20 and 21, but you beloved building yourselves up. The word building is the same Greek word for edifice from the other verse in 1 Corinthians. Building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. That's your heavenly language. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. When you pray in your heavenly language, you actually make yourself stronger in your faith. You actually make yourself stronger in the love of God and you actually understand the mercy and the love that God has for you even more. One prescription for an individual who's having difficulty in life accepting that God cares about them, God loves them, is to have a season of praying in the Spirit. If you will pray in the Spirit and you will read the scriptures about the love of God, they will become more real to you, more real to you, more real to you, and you can grasp and understand the love of God. I am trying to communicate to you that you can supernaturally live in your life. I don't care where your life journey takes you. If you are in school, work, or both, if you are retired or working towards getting retired, if you are a parent or a grandparent, it makes no difference. The Holy Spirit has been given to you to comfort you, direct you, guide you, show you things to come, and he chose in his sovereignty to give you a language for you to communicate to God beyond your own ability and for you to get bigger and stronger and more powerful. It says in Ephesians chapter six, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So Paul, it tells us that we are supposed to be praying in the spirit regularly for other people. It says in Romans chapter eight, this is one that I have fallen back on many, many a times. Likewise, the spirit, this is the Holy Spirit, also helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. There are times in life where life has brought so much pain to me. Have you ever had that event? Where life brought so much pain that it was hard even to pray in the Spirit and it just seemed like at the time I was calling out to God from deep inside my heart and spirit with a cry or a groan. And I truly believe that the Holy Spirit is saying, I'm with you, I feel your pain, I'm helping you, and we're going to get through this. And he had to take over for me. And I believe this is Romans chapter 8. There are times in verse 26, there are times in life. And I think that every one of us probably have faced a, a time in life where where life is so painful that you're not even sure if you can continue in this journey of pain. And this is where the Holy Spirit says, I can fight the pain for you. And I really believe that the Holy Spirit gets in front of us as our shield and our buckler, our high tower and our protection. And God wants to cause us to understand all. Now it says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse six, you still have 14 open, you can go over to verse six. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, see the word if. There are four conditional clauses in the Greek language for the word if. One of them is if and it's not true. One of them is if and it's true. One of them is if and I wish it were true. And one of them is if, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Those, whenever you see the word if in the English language, it's going to be one of those conditional clauses. This one here is the word if and it is true. 
is it is definite in its, its writing by Paul. It says, but now, brethren, if, and it's true, I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? What Paul is saying here, I am coming to you, church of Corinth. I'm coming to you, church of Corinth. And you remember, Apollos was there. And Apollos um, didn't handle the, the mistakes that the church of Corinth was going through. So Paul says, I'm on my way. And Paul says, on my way, I am praying in tongues for you. But what good would it do if I come and I keep speaking in tongues unless I gave to you either revelation, knowledge, prophesying, or teaching. Here's what Paul is declaring to all of us. Every single person who speaks in tongues, who prays in tongues, becomes a better person at their calling. Paul was called to give revelation, called to give knowledge, called to give prophesying, called to give teaching. Paul was not called, and you read his writings, you can understand, wasn't called to give nurturing. But some of you are. Paul wasn't called to be an engineer, but some of you are. Paul wasn't called to be a police officer, but some of you are. Paul wasn't called to be a mother, but some of you are. Here's what I'm saying. Whatever you're calling, you will get better at. Whatever it is you do at life, you will gain revelation on how to do it, knowledge on how to do it, prophesying over your own life on doing it, and you will gain teaching. In other words, you will find God will lead you to what you need to know to do your, jo- your life, your job, your place better in life. So if you are a student and you're about to go into finals, it would be good to take 10 minutes, 15 minutes before you crack open the books and pray in the spirit. And it would be good to spend another five minutes in the parking lot before you go into class to take your final. If you are thinking of getting a new job, it would be good to pray over your own life in the spirit and see what God has to say about it. Where God wants to lead you and guide you and direct you. What I really liked about Paul is Paul said this. He goes, I pray in tongues more than you all. Now he's saying that to the church of Corinth. And in the Greek, it basically says this. I pray in tongues more than all of you collectively. All of you collectively. My life has been literally transformed because of being filled with the Holy Spirit, being able to call on the presence of the Holy Spirit, and being able to pray in the Spirit on a regular basis. I told you that I pray in tongues a minimum of 30 minutes every single day. The reason I know it's 30 minutes is because I can get lost in prayer and mess up my whole day schedule because I could go too long. So I set a timer on my cell phone. I just set it for 30 minutes and I just start praying and then I don't have to think about what time it is. When it goes beep, 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 I just stop. And I have to go to the next item in my day. But then I pray throughout the day and I pray throughout the rest of the day, continue, sometimes little short bursts of prayer. Sometimes, oh God, help. And sometimes inside, I don't know what to do here. You know, let me hear your voice. It might be, whatever it might be, whatever you're going through, the Lord wants to lead you and guide you. And I want you to know that you can be filled with the Holy Spirit and not be wacky, not be weird. We don't want wacky, weird. We want just real, real life, real supernatural stuff, really led by the Holy Spirit and edifying ourselves. So to recap, Why pray in the spirit? One, it makes your faith stronger. Two, it gives you the ability to resist temptation better. Three, it gives you an avenue of prayer when you do not know how to pray. Four, you learn the secrets of the kingdom of God. Five, you grow in knowledge and spiritual truth. Six, it will develop your personal gifts and talents for God's kingdom. And seven, God the creator of the universe declares you need this gift. Now, Let's do question and answers. Do you guys got a microphone? Can we use that one? Okay. One of the things that people ask is, um, can you pray in the spirit at will? I've been told. And see, that's the problem. A lot of us have been told stuff that's not in the Bible. I was told once that you can never, ever pray in the spirit unless you felt like the spirit came upon you. Well, my answer is he never left me. 
And that I'm not supposed to be walking by feelings. And yes, I can pray in the spirit at will because Paul made this statement. I will pray in the spirit and I will pray in the understanding where Paul said it's his will. It's his under, It's his choice. He's not leaving because he's mad at me. <laughs> okay. Anybody have any questions on praying in the spirit? Yes. They're going to get a microphone to you. Um, I, I think you've already kind of covered this, but I just want clarification. So what about sp um, speaking in tongues during a, like a regular service like, like here where we all are? Okay, good question. What about speaking in tongues a regular service if, if here? There are two kinds of tongues, a public tongue and a private tongue. There are times where we will actually, a leader of the church may lead you in prayer, and that would be appropriate under your breath, quietly, to be praying in the spirit at that time. Um, then there is public tongues. Oh, oh also in the worship, and there, there, there are times, you may even hear some people in the room when they're lifting their hands, and they're really not singing the words that are on the screen, they're, they're just singing to the melody in the spirit. Um, I think Paul, his biggest statement that he's bringing in there for or, everything to be decent in order, that if we, if we disrupt the order of what God's already doing, that can be wrong. But then there's the public tongues. That's number two, the public tongues. The Bible declares that there is a gift where peop, some, some people have this gift where they speak in tongues and another person gives the interpretation. According to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, that should only happen in a public setting three times. You're supposed to limit it to three. And when you find that, he says, let, let one speak in tongues and the other interpret. And if nobody interprets, like if somebody speaks in tongues publicly and no one gives the interpretation, that's a sign, no more speaking in tongues publicly, that the Holy Spirit isn't moving that way. Uh, and then it's the same with prophecy. There are supposed to only be three prophetic. Uh, that would be three prophetic. As you read it, you will find three prophetic giftings. In other words, you have three prophets that are going to prophesy. They may actually give more than three words, uh, but it's only supposed to be with those three people. It's the same with the tongues interpretation. But I could take longer to explain that. I kind of rushed it. Did it help? Okay. I've witnessed it before in other settings, and it quite frankly freaked me right out. It, it can be done incorrectly. And it can be done extremely emotional and it can be done habitual. And here's what I mean by habitual. When I was uh, in a church and, and I wasn't in the ministry yet, I, I was in a church and it was a charismatic church, Pentecostal more um, in, its, in its foundation. Um, there was a particular person at a particular time in the service every single Sunday night speaking tongues. Every single time. It was like, okay. And why is it always a sister? <laughs> it was a sister. And she, you know, not my sister. It was a sister. But it, this woman would speak in tongues at the exact same time. And it just seemed monotonous. It seemed repetitive. It seemed habitual. It didn't seem fresh. And I think that we have to, as leaders in the church... Make sure that we are hearing from the Holy Spirit and it's fresh from God. Most pastors have never been trained ever on what to do when it goes awry and how to get the service back. I've learned because it's gone awry. <laughs> they, call it, they call it OJT. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I was, I was told that sometimes when you're in the middle of the night or two or three o'clock in the morning, the spirit can move you because there's maybe somebody on the other part of the world that needs praying. So collectively, we don't know that that person needs prayer. And then my second question is when I'm praying over somebody, is it wrong for me to just, you know, somebody that doesn't know the Lord. And then I tell them, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to pray my spirit on my prayer language over you. Um, hoping that, you know, I don't want to spook about anything, but at the same time, you know, 
is it proper for me to do that, you know, in, during that situation? I, I'm going to do number two first, second question first. And that is, um, if you're praying with somebody and you're privately praying and you're explaining to them, hey, you know, I have this language that the Holy Spirit has given me and I would like to use that to pray for you. They may have some reference for it or not. And if they're saying yes, go ahead, then you have the permission. And they're not going to be, you know, freaked out. Because we can, we can mishandle the gifts of the Holy Spirit and freak people out. And Paul even says that, you know, in 1 Corinthians 14. He says, you know, if you're all speaking in tongues and a non-believer comes in, I'm thinking to seek you're crazy. And so Paul says, hey, let's get a balance in here and find out how, how to have things done that amplifies the goodness of God and not the individual. So if you have their permission, you can. A lot of times, like this morning when I prayed for the people up here, I left my microphone on because I was also praying in a way to teach people that may not know how to pray for someone that so they could hear me pray. I did it on purpose. Most of the time I turn my microphone off and the majority of the time when people are standing up here and I'm praying for them, laying hands on them, I'm probably 50% of the time I'm praying in the spirit over them, but I'm doing it softly. I'm doing it quietly. Uh, if I know the individual um, and if I know that person, which I know a lot of you, and I know that I can comfortably let you hear me pray in tongues over you, I may do it a little bit louder. Uh, I think I'm pretty public about that. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and I, I pray in tongues and I'm not wacko. I'm a pretty stable person. Um, so uh, uh, now the first one I forgot. Oh, in the middle of the night. Yeah. Now you said that you, you okay, I'm going to say it this way. I, I'm going to answer it the way that I heard it. I don't believe that the Holy Spirit will wake you up at two o'clock in the morning and all of a sudden you are praying in the spirit out of control. You will be in control. I absolutely believe that the Holy Spirit can wake you up at two o'clock in the morning with this unction. You need to pray now and you have to start praying. You need to pray. And if you know the Holy Spirit has woke you up at two o'clock in the morning, I would not be concerned who it is, whether they're on the other side of the world or the other side of the bed. Just start praying. You know, and if there's someone else on the other side of the bed, like your wife, you may want to leave the room to go pray because she may not have been woken up by the Holy Spirit to pray. So now there are, there are times I'm going to, I'm going to put on an exception. There are times where people have been in a season of prayer. And what I mean by that is they just have had this heaviness of God that there's a lot of need to pray. And then in the middle of the night, they've, they, they've been praying most of the day. They've been praying on multiple days. They've been praying throughout the day. And they have woken up in the middle of the night praying in the spirit. But it's not scaring them. It's not frightening them. It's not something taken over. They've already made the decision that I'm, I'm in this season. I'm leaning my, giving myself over to you, Holy Spirit. And I'm, I just want to be a vessel for you. So it, it can happen not just at two o'clock in the morning. It can happen at two o'clock in the afternoon as well. If you've got that unction from the Holy Spirit, then you do want to start praying. That's where the Holy Spirit and praying in the Spirit is so important. There's, we don't know all that there is. I don't know everything going on in your life, but yet I pray for you intimately. And the way I do is by praying in the Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit knows you intimately. He knows your issues. He knows your issues. So I, I pray in the Spirit for you regularly because I don't know all the facts. You have a question? Uh, you've already half answered it with his. Um, is it natural to go back and forth from praying in the knowledge and praying in the spirit and from worshiping in the knowledge and worshiping in spirit? Just drift back and forth between the two. Absolutely. Absolutely. That was an easy one. Yes. I often wake up at um, a specific time, like several days in a row, like... 4.47. What is that? You often wake up at a specific time. Yeah. Like, at what was the time again? 4.47. 4.47. And you just wake up at 4.47. To pray. And I figure, oh, to pray. I figure, Lord, you're asking me to pray. So I pray, but, but because it's consistently 4.47. At 4.47. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> I think that's cool. 
Let's see, what am I doing at 447 so that you could be praying for me? <laughs> um, I, I think God and the Holy Spirit just has your in, internal clock connected. And you probably, uh, right at that time at 447, your internal clock is like ready to go, active. Are you a morning person? Okay, so it's probably you're, you, you're clear-headed. There are a lot of people, a lot of sleep experts that say that um, a lot, most people are supposed to wake up about 10 minutes before they actually do and that they'll actually be brighter. Like, like when you said, oh, I'm not really, you woke up naturally. Have you, and uh, this has nothing to do with tongues, has to do with sleeping. <laughs> if you are just asleep and you wake up naturally, like at 447, don't force yourself to go back to sleep because if you sleep for 15 more minutes, you're going to wake up more tired than if you got out of bed at 447 because your body is saying, I'm done, and now you're putting it back into a mode it doesn't want to be. Now, back to speaking in tongues and praying in tongues. Sounds like you got a, a call to prayer at 447. That's cool. <laughs> Another question. You, you mentioned that uh, you pray for us daily, 30 minutes in the tongues. What is it that you do to bring about each person and what you feel their needs are to recall the going into the spirit to pray for it? Okay, when I say that I pray for you every day um, for 30 minutes, I pray for you collectively. I pray in the spirit so that God can um, have you. And then there are times, there are times where a face will come to me, a name will come to me, a story will come to me about someone's life. And then I know that, okay, we're praying for this, you know. Um, it, was, it was two days ago, I was praying for someone in the church. And while I was praying, the Lord said this. They don't have cancer. They're going to get cancer, but they're not going to die. So I'm praying in the spirit. I said, okay. Um, and, that, and I felt like that's all I'm supposed to pray. Their success through this moment. I know who the person is. So I, when it happens, I will be ready. So, well, why does that have to happen? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Any other questions? Wait, we have to go back there because he already asked one all the way back. We'll, we'll let you have a redo when there's no new ones. <laughs> um, my question is, being a Christian a long time, but not having any experience in this, is there a practical way to get from here to there kind of thing? Oh, what a great question. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <coughs> there is. There is. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm kind of excited. <laughs> um, the way you get from here to there it's just like my journey and so many other people's journeys is you just get prayed for. You, the desire. Okay, I, now I'm going to pretend that I'm praying for somebody to get filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm, I'm on the ministry team because all our ministry team have all been trained for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Every one of them is already filled with the Holy Spirit. Every one of them already has a prayer language and they all feel comfortable. I can pray for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit or they wouldn't be on the team. And so here's, here's what I, here's what I, uh, I'll put it. When I was a young minister before I was a pastor and I was traveling to different churches, I was, I told, the Lord told me that every single person I pray for who wants to be filled, who wants, hear that? Yes. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, will be filled with the Holy Spirit and I would hear them speak in tongues. That was over 40 years ago and it's happened true to this day. And I was in a Spanish Assembly of God church in Santa Ana. And I was talking on the, on the Holy Spirit, something like today. And I was talking on the Holy Spirit. And I was praying for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I was praying for most of the people. I, I don't speak Spanish. And there were several people who don't speak English. So how we communicated, and there was no interpreter, I don't know. But the, well, I had three or four people come up to get prayed for, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I laid hands on them, laid hands on them, laid hands on them. And this one man, he fell under the power of God onto the floor, began to speak in tongues. And I just went to the next person. I was praying for them. And, um, and you say, well, why'd they fall on the floor? Just the, it's called um, 
Signs and wonders? It's a sign and you wonder? (laughs) It's just the presence of God. And sometimes there's just not the ability to stay there. And while I'm praying for another person, praying for another person, then I pray for this elderly lady. Now, remember, I was 22, so she was like 67. That's old. (laughs) To 22. I prayed for her. Power of God hit her. She fell under the power and hit her head on the pew. No pad. And she bounced. Hit her head on the pew. Bounced onto the ground. Now you're 22 and you're praying for people and you go, Oh my. And she laid there praying in the spirit had never been filled with Holy spirit laid there praying the spirit. When she came, she had no clue that it happened. She said she felt like a feather and that she was just laid down really softly on the ground. She had no bump, no injury, no anything. You know, we have padded chairs. <laughs> but back to your question, Jesse, I'm, I'm walking through of how this, how this would take place. The, the man got up and he said that he had been wanting to be filled with the Holy Spirit for 30 years. 30 years. Nobody told him, you don't have to tarry. You just have to receive. So here's what I said. If you are saved, if you are born again, you have the right to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. It is, Jesus said, I don't want you to go out into the world until you go to Jerusalem and receive the power from on high. And they receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Everywhere Paul went, he prayed for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Everywhere Peter Peter went, he prayed for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It is the norm of Book of Acts. It's not the norm in the United States but it's the norm of the book of Acts. And so what, what people have been told through tradition is you have, I've had people say, you have to take off your jewelry. You have to, you know, <laughs> I've been around. <clears throat> and that you have to tarry and you have to confess all your sins. You have to do all this stuff. I said, no, 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 no. You have to be born again. That's the criteria. You have, so here's what I do. I, when I pray for someone to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and I'm not sure who they are, I always lead them into salvation first. I just say, say this after me. And I ask them to repeat and confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's what I ask. Then I pray for them to receive the Holy Spirit. And here's what I said. That if you have received salvation, you receive the presence of the Holy Spirit the same way. If you have the Holy Spirit, if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, then you already have the gift of tongues. And now you need to now exercise that gift by faith. And the way you do it by faith is you actually have to move some kind of voice box, vocal cords. Something has to physically move for that sound to come out. So you do have to cooperate. It didn't work for me, you know, for three nights in a row with the book. (laughs) Nothing happened. It wasn't until I actually engaged my vocal cords and then, and, uh, and then say something and just give myself over to what I believe is a walk of faith and have that heavenly language. So you have to actually say something. Now, I've seen people coach people. I'm not one of those. I don't coach you. I don't say repeat this word 15 times. Um, you know, I've actually seen people tickle them under the throat. Uh, I've seen all kinds of stuff. The reason you guys have never seen that is because we're kind of level-headed here, you know. And, and, but here's what I'm saying is that you, you pray and you believe, you receive. And now, now, now listen to this. Uh, my denomination has now changed that. Our denomination has changed their stance on it. And I'm really glad that they have and they've clarified it. But it was of a long time ago, there was this belief that you are not filled with Holy Spirit unless you have the evidence of speaking in tongues. And I have said from day one, that doesn't make sense. I can't speak in tongues unless I am filled with the Holy Spirit. Can you be filled with the Holy Spirit and not speak in tongues? Absolutely. Why? Because you must have the presence of the Holy Spirit and the infilling of the Holy Spirit first. 
whether that's one second, one year, ten years, the time is no different. But why do you want to wait ten years if the God of the universe wants you to be filled with the power and have that heavenly language and get these benefits in your life? So I say, no waiting, but cooperation. And that is, I am a Christian, I'm, and I have, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, and I receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit, and now I am filled with the Spirit. I speak in tongues. When I go buy a car, I expect the tires to come with it. <laughs> have you ever noticed that when you test drive the car, and you say, okay, I'm, I'll take it? that they don't take the tires off and then say, okay, see ya. <laughs> they, they include the tires. When you receive the Holy Spirit, it includes the gift of your prayer language because it would be totally unfair of God if one person had the benefit to get these seven things in their life, these six benefits in their life, and the other person didn't. It would be unfair of God if one person could receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit and edify themselves, but another person couldn't because the edification is a personal thing. It's for you. So to finish it, we, when we close our service, we'll have an opportunity to pray for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit and have your prayer language. But what we're going to do, because when the service is over with, we're doing a baby dedication, and we're doing that baby dedication right here in front of the cross. So we will take all of the people who would like to be filled with the Holy Spirit into another room. And we will pray there. We have a team of people who can pray for you, and you can leave today with your heavenly language. You can leave today with your heavenly language. And let me prepare you for what will happen over the next couple of days. When you receive your heavenly language, you are going to know that something's different. But then you're going to have this thought. Oh, maybe not, maybe not. I had this thought. Uh, three, four days later, a month later, I had this thought. You just made that up. You're just like playing cowboys and Indians when you were a little kid. You just, you know, all that stuff. That's the devil trying to steal the power of God from you. You just say, get out of here, devil. God has given me my language. Did you learn something today? Could we give the Lord a hand?